beautiful reminder that God has done for us through Jesus Christ what we could not do for ourselves, lest we ever think that we deserve salvation. Um, I want to, have y'all ever, I just want to start this way, have y'all ever seen a turtle on a fence post? You ever seen one? And if you ever do, you don't have to ask how did the turtle get, get itself up there? Because you know somebody helped it get there. It didn't get there by itself. Am I right? I'm kind of trying to be funny a little bit. <laughs> You're a lot like that turtle. I'm a lot like that turtle. We by no means can get to heaven on our own without the grace of Jesus Christ. We don't have the ability we never have. And if I give you the little maybe 30-second snippet of the gospel that I would give in a little bit longer session in my next steps deal would be this. In the beginning in Genesis, we see in the very beginning at the garden, God created man and woman. He gave them the opportunity to do as he asked them to do. They rebelled. And we've been reaping consequences of sin that was sown ever since. All of the Old Testament is a picture of a temporary sacrificial system that God provided and a prophecy looking forward of what would come in a beautiful sacrificial lamb that is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that is the fulfilled prophecy in the New Testament. In light of that, all the other books in the Bible after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the story of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as God's perfect lamb, they are a picture of how to live life as a result of being a believer in Jesus Christ, as a result of the grace provided to you and I. That's the gospel in a nutshell. You say, well, who decided the blood had to be applied? It happened all the way back in the garden when God decided that, this, that the requirement for sin was a blood sacrifice. You say, are you sure? Well, the, the scriptures tell us enough to know that after they got ashamed and put their fig leaves on and knitted them some kind of covering together because they, now they were naked and ashamed. Before they didn't feel guilty, they were naked and not ashamed. And so um, the Bible says that when he sent them out of the garden, he sent them out in animal skins. You don't get animal skins like without something giving its life. And we find throughout the rest of the story of the Old Testament that that was the picture. In other words, God made it that way, not you and me. And it takes the burden off of us to have to figure out all the whys in the world because there's a lot of whys in the world that I can't figure out. Are there with you? Are there a lot of places where you've said, God, why did this happen? And why did that happen? And why is it, why is it like this? And why did you make it that way? You know, I have plenty of questions, plenty of things that, 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 that cause moments where I have to trust God, but there's plenty of other moments where I'm, I'm like, God, thank you so much. I never would have done it this way, but thank you so much that you did. You know what I mean? We give, we give him credit for the things that aren't what we'd like for them to be, but we give him very little credit for the things that are. Now, I've told you all of that. One, because if you've never trusted Christ, you need to know this is the foundation upon which everything else is built. It's the foundation of Scripture. Uh, it's also important that as we look at this idea, this series we're in with Good News Bay, we're going to be talking about being uh, discipleship farmers, farming disciples. You're like, what? Uh, yep, you got to get your overalls out because we're, we're getting ready to do some farming. Uh, not really, but we are going to talk about sowing and reaping a little bit and what the, the Scripture teaches about that, and that involves work. That involves effort on our part. That is not how salvation is provided. Salvation provided by the grace of Jesus Christ, but because of what he's done, if we look at how he's created and ordered the world and what he would have of us as our Savior, he's given us some things to be about. In Ephesians, it tells us that he's created works, good works in advance for us to do. We are his workmanship. We've been made fresh and new. And yet still we have this struggle. Have you noticed it if you've ever trusted Christ? Still we have this ongoing struggle with sin. Anybody here doesn't have a struggle with sin? Don't even raise your hand because everybody will laugh at you. I mean, you get laughed out of the place. Um, and, and you need to know that as I uh, infer upon you a guilt and a wretchedness that comes inherent to every individual, I'm saying it not because you are and I'm not. I'm saying it because I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm saying it not because I accepted Christ when I was young and lived this whole time becoming more like Jesus and now I'm this super, ho super holy roller. The fact of the matter is I pray that I'm a better reflection of Christ than when I started but the fact of the matter is I'm more aware now of my flaws than I've ever been. I'm more aware in these days of my unrighteousness before God and my unfitness to be in the presence of holy God. Because, because without his grace, like, I mean, me comparing one another to, like, to our, that's not what we do. We compare ourselves to each other. That's not, that's not how it works. And what I'm saying to you is that we are all on this same track. Uh, 
It's a different sermon. I probably ought to talk about it a different day. Let me get to where we need to get to. Uh, you may or may not have heard of a guy named Gideon Thomas. Gideon Thomas was a, a person in our community a long, long time ago, like in the 1930s. Uh, in 1935, he sought to build and broke ground on the first hotel on Panama City Beach. I haven't looked the whole story up. He died in 1937, so I'm not sure how much of it he got to see. But I will tell you this, they thought he was crazy. They thought that he had lost his mind for wanting to build a building on that dirty white sand, out that ugly stuff, out on the beach. They're like, what in the world are you doing? He built a, they say he built a two-story, 12-room hotel, and so tourism began in Panama City. His response to the people that thought he was, was nuts, he says, listen, I'm not trying to grow vegetables, I'm trying to grow people. And I want you to think about that for a minute, not in terms of tourism, but in terms of spirituality. Our responsibility before God is not to grow vegetables. It's not even to build buildings. It's to grow a kingdom, which is people. It is to invest in people that they might choose Christ and then see them develop, see them become more like Jesus Christ. That's what the first apostles did is they they shared what had been shared with them, and it went from one generation to the next, and it expanded. Again, I don't know that I would have chosen to do it that way. I don't think I would have trusted us, you, me, any of the rest of the history, because they hadn't had a tremendous track record with all of it, to be honest with you. But this is how God saw fit for it to be. So where do you get all that from? Well, you get it from Scripture. It's pretty obvious. And I, 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 I want to stay focused with, with all of us here if we can, because we've been talking about good news. Good news is the gospel. The gospel is the the, the fact that, that we can find salvation in Jesus Christ, but then as we do, we do what he told us to be about. And his authoritative words in what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, after reminding us that he had all authority in heaven and earth, uh, he told us to go make disciples and uh, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he said to teach them everything that I've commanded you. Let me just tell you, that's a process of farming disciples. It is, it is, it is the, 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 the law of the harvest at play. You say, well, is that a real thing? The law of the harvest is found throughout the Scripture in so many different areas. Um, in fact, we probably are going to look at a few of those in the next couple, three, four weeks. Jesus told parables, many of them, that had agricultural underpinnings. Why would he do that? Because they understood it and because it reflected a process, one, that God created in, his, in, 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 in that he created the, all the agricultural processes themselves, but also it reflects principles of heaven. If we look at the basic idea of sowing and reaping, sowing is the planting, reaping is the, 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 the harvest of that which comes up as a result, there are several principles at play that matter. Now, we see those in a variety of different places, but specifically today, we're going to go to a text that I've been to before, and we can't stop going there because it's a picture of what, what we want to see pop up in our life. Like, if we're going to see in our lives and in the lives of people that become a part of this body of believers and influence that we have within uh, this community and, and, and within our homes, our schools, etc., then we have to sow the right thing to reap the right thing. Because one of the laws of, 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 of the harvest, I mean, it's just, we could talk to Miss Pelton and wherever she's at. Miss Be Becky, she's, she's like super rock star at Bozeman High School with all the agricultural stuff. She knows all this genetic engineering stuff they can do. I mean, they make plants a lot of things. I mean, it would be a fun chalk just to see all the things they can do with plants. They can change the way that a, uh, a vegetable probably tastes. They can talk about how quick it grows, how slow it grows. They can make it be sweeter or a whole variety of different things, make it mul multiply quicker because they can engineer all that. But at the end of the day, they're also with those things. They don't ever plant a seed that pops up something else. It doesn't work like that. And in our own lives, we have a desire. I think we have a desire that God would bless us with results in our life, with fruit in our life that reflects not just what we desire, but that reflects a long-term best hope, best plan, God's best in our life. He's described those as fruits of his spirit. And he says, if you sow to the spirit, here's what you're going to get. If you sow to the flesh, here's what you're going to get. It's this principle, by the way, within the law of harvest is cause and effect. It's, you know, cause and effect anymore is like that. Nobody wants to talk about cause and effect. We got a few of y'all are going to camp. Some of y'all are going to chaperone. Some of y'all are going as uh, participants. I've been a few times. Let me just tell you who you don't want to be. 
You don't want to be that middle school boy that decides not to take a shower. Let me just tell you right now, Mama, if you've got a sixth grader going to camp, if you've got a senior going to remind them to take a shower because here's what is inevitable. What happens if they don't shower? They stink. <laughs> Cause and effect. You see how that works? A bath a day keeps the B.O. away. I mean, it's kind of that, kind of that deal. And after you shower, you need to put some deodorant on. I mean, these are boys. They got hormones raging through them like nobody's business. Maybe like they never, ever will again in their life. And for some of us, when we're young and full of all kind of testosterone, we need deodorant. Did anybody else ever go? I'm not telling y'all too much. You go through this phase where you, you sweat and you stink. And your mama's like, son, did you put deodorant on? I'm like, well, mom, I tried, but here's the deal. Put your deodorant on after you bathe. You know, there was this thing I've been listening. I've been listening. Alex is preaching these days every now and then, and he's been talking about Annabelle, and they got this rule at their house, no bow, no go, right? Well, for camp, it ought to be no D-O, no B-O. You got it. You got it. I mean, we like things. I don't know where Doug's at. He likes things in simple terms. That's the deal. I'm going to give you another basic truth of cause and effect. You don't brush your teeth, you probably won't get to keep them very long. I mean, this is how it works. She's like, what are you talking about? It, it's, it's, it's really predictable. If you brush your teeth in the morning, people enjoy talking to you because your breath doesn't stink. And later on in life, when you smile, you'll have all of them. He said, well, you're being mean. No, I'm being honest. This is real life. Like, we don't like to acknowledge there are laws of cause and effect in, at work around us, laws of harvest, laws of sowing and reaping. I want to be careful I don't get into too many of the examples of how this works in real life, but you know this is true. Like you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know that if you don't study for the test, in your right mind, you don't really expect to do that well. And when you don't do well because you didn't study, now some of you study hard and maybe you didn't study the right stuff, maybe you missed some communication, hey, maybe the responsibility is there on you too, right? Were you there that day? Did you take notes? Were you focused? Did you listen to what the teacher said? Did you look at the syllabus? Did you go back and ask somebody? I mean, there's all these things that maybe you didn't do. You're like, yeah, but, but, but it's never your fault, right? And it just never ever is. It's always the teacher's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. And nobody wants to say, well, I didn't study like I should have. Well, if you didn't study and you didn't make the grade, why didn't you make the grades? Because you didn't study. Dodo bird. I mean, am I allowed to tell you that? That's just not smart. And God's built the world in such a way that sometimes when people don't do smart stuff, it hurts a lot. And you know what happens whenever you don't do start smart stuff and it hurts a lot? Are you as likely to do it the next time? No. Until we create a world when people do things that aren't very smart and we never let it hurt. And that's not ungracious. That is actually unkind. See, that's where it just got politically incorrect. But sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. What did, by the way, any athletes in here? We know it's true with athletics, don't we? We know that the greats don't become great by watching other greats. They become great by practice and training and hard work and years of experience. And it helps if God gifted you with a genetically superior body, right? And I know that some of you are 12 and 13 and uh, maybe you're 52 and you're looking in the mirror and like, I've got a genetically gifted body. Well, let me just tell you, big dog, sowing and reaping still matters. Because a genetically gifted body without the right work is going to not produce a whole lot of anything relative to whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, right? Because it doesn't just happen. Coach, it never worked that way, did it? No, it doesn't work that way. Football teams aren't going to do that. They're not just going to show up the first day and first game and they hadn't practiced anything and nobody who's in, knows who's in charge. And we're like, hey, let's just go run that thing we talked about the other day. I'm feeling it right now, guys. I'm just feeling it. Let's just, you know, we can just do it all organic. Like we can just go with our gut right here. Y'all just line up, ready to go. I don't care where you go. You'll know where to go. You'll know when you get there. All right. No, that's not how that works. It's not how that works. I've never played a down of football in my life. Can you tell? I mean, it, you can tell. Sowing and reaping. But the things that matter the most should be the priorities, right? The things that, that are most critical in our lives should be the things that if we don't get the other stuff done, at least we got to do the things that are going to come back to bite us, that are going to be painful if we don't do the right sowing. We talked about prayer last week in this panel discussion with Carl and anxiety in families and a lot of different things. Do you think if there's a practice of prayer in a home that it eliminates some anxiety? If there's a practice of knowing scripture and knowing what God has said about some things and teaching those along the way that it helps? We also establish that God's grace covered it if you didn't do that, right? I mean, God's grace can provide. He can help you through some things, but it doesn't necessarily take 
the pain away relative to the law of the harvest and sowing and reaping. Let me read you a text because it matters. It's word. That's the only reason this has any authority. But you, th these days they say you don't just need to give them the word. You need to show them how the word works. This is true all around us. And somehow spiritually we think there's a disconnect and we can get by with it. And it doesn't matter in spiritual things. But that's just not true. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians 5 and 22 and 23, and then I'm going to give you 24. Let me back up. That's not, I want more than that. How many did I give y'all? I gave, yeah, I gave, I just gave you 22. Go back up to the top. They can work on their feet. If they can, I'm going to read it anyway, but they can. He says in verse 16, Paul does, he's writing to him, and he says, uh, walk by the Spirit. And if you do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You're going to see this comparison, spirit, flesh. Flesh is just natural passions, things you desire, want to indulge in. You know, it's a dozen donuts, a Krispy Kreme, hot, the lights on hot and now. Doesn't mean you can't have one every now and then, but you make that decision over and over and over again, you're going to have a Krispy Kreme body. And don't nobody want no Krispy Kreme body. <laughs> they don't want to see you. They don't want to see it on the beach. They, don't want, it's going to be, it, they might want to see you for your cardiologist. I mean, that's really harsh. And you're like, wait a minute, you can't say that. That's the problem. We're not saying that. Like, that's the problem. Yes, yes. Can I tell you, when you went out to eat this week, whatever restaurant you went to, when I went to get my Whataburger numerous days now, and there ain't, the, the, the door is shut. Can I tell you, I know why? Because they gave money away to people that didn't want to work, Amen. and then they didn't come to work. Because nobody wants to work. You say, preacher, come on now. First Thessalonians, first or second? Second Thessalonians. Y'all need to know this is here. Y'all need to talk about this on the way home from lunch today with y'all's kids. You wanted something to talk about. Here we go. Sowing and reaping. I wanted to fit this in someplace. I knew it was supposed to be in here. It's not just a pet peeve. It's the Bible. Y'all didn't know it was in the Bible. God has an opinion about who ought to be working. Just wanted you to know. It says it right here. When people buy like idle hands or the devil's workshop, comes out of 2 Thessalonians. doesn't say the exact word, but the premise is here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For, let it hurt. For we, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Remember that. Not working. There's some idleness. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Such persons we command and encourage in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, because all y'all are workers. Y'all not just sitting at home till the government checks run out. Our people wouldn't do that because Christ wouldn't do that. Christ doesn't honor that. That's called, it's called lazy. It's called slothful. In case you think I'm name calling, look up the word sloth in the Bible. Look up the word lazy and see how positive God's word is about that. Plenty to say about those that cannot do for themselves. Plenty more to be said about those that won't try. See, this isn't politics, what we're talking about up in here. I'm going I'm I'm to get into everybody. I'm, I've already told you, I'm a sinner among us, and I've been convicted of some things myself this week, and I'm going to just keep giving it to you. But we, we got a problem, and here's the problem. You sow a world where nobody works, eventually, you, if you hadn't made the connection, there won't be anybody doing any work. Everybody's going to be on the receiving end. It's predictable. You, you, can't, you can't just keep reaping the benefits for today, play the video games at home during the daytime, and think that you're doing your civic duty in that process. And I hope I can just say this out loud and make an example out of it. Um, I've said some really kind things about the Sutherland family. I, th I think I saw Allie over here. Are you there? Yeah. She works jobs all the time. And every kid in that family, I haven't known Samantha and Stephanie as much as I've known Allie and as I've known Abby. And along the way, they missed church some on Sundays, but usually when they were going to miss, it wasn't because they were out sloughing off. It's because they were working. It's because in their family for multiple generations, their family made them work. And the reason they made them work was because they believed this text. Like that's part of who we are and I'll also, and I got, I'm on a soapbox, sorry. This is healthy, those guys. I hope you're hearing my heart on this. Like, I hope that you understand. I don't mean to willfully hurt anybody, but it's the same principle that makes, has made it so hard. Like, if I'm talking about 
locally, how, it, how does it work? And this isn't, it's not a statement about the people that have worked for us. It's about how hard it's been to get more people to come work with us, whether we're talking about folks in the kitchen or folks that are keeping kids in the nursery. Like, there's no, it's not easy to get anybody to do anything. And it's not just Bay County. Some of y'all think it's Bay County. Y'all ain't figured it out yet. I went to Mobile a couple weeks ago. You guess what's in Mobile? Signs on every restaurant door that says, we would love to be able to serve you better, but we can't. We got tons of empty space on the inside uh, for you to sit, but we got nobody to cook for you, nobody to serve for you. Because? Because, well, we are just hadn't turned the government faucet off just yet. And so nobody wants to go to work. Do you think people have more time to protest in the process? I don't. Y'all? You better not. I mean, it's okay to protest some things, right? But not if I, it's idle hands become the devil's workshop. I've been to kids' camp, and I've been to youth camp. Let me just tell you, youth camp's better because those kids, you don't have to have every minute scheduled, but you better not give them too much free time. I mean, I'm looking out here, some of these fellas, they'll have their trucks that will tie it up to something and be having them a toe, toe contest or something. Because you just give them, and that, that's not ungodly, that's just men being men. Not see, we learned that brains of men are not fully developed whenever they're 18. We learned that. We did. And, and, and we learned they can't see the law. And I'm not picking on men. Ladies, I don't think, I've watched some of y'all, I don't think y'all's brains fully developed either at a young age. I mean, I don't. I think you're all grown up, but you don't know what to do with yourself. And you hadn't looked at the long-term consequences. Like, how does this work out down there? Here's what they said about, y'all Y'all let me freelance a little bit. I hope it's all right. What they said about old men, I'm calling myself old. I'm 46. I'm not. Many of you guys are like, come on, man, don't hurt me. I'm a little bit older than that. A guy my age, there's some things I'm listening to you young guys talking about, and I'm like, nope, I'm going to bed because i got to work tomorrow. I can't, I can't start that early and go that late and still get it done the next day. Some of you are like, well, let's jump off of this. I'm like, nope, I want to walk in a couple of days. I, I got it, you know, well, throw that. No, I'm saving every cast I got in this arm right here. There ain't going to be no volleyball. There's, not, there's a lot of things we're not doing. Uh, and I hate to tell you, I've learned my lesson on the snowboard, never snowboarding again. I'm still recovering. <laughs> my wrists still hurt. Why? Because now my brain has learned that the hormone that, that says, oh, look what we just did. This was exciting. It was a thrill. It, it ain't quite as potent as it used to be. But that part of my brain that's fully developed that says, hey, that's going to hurt tomorrow. Hey, <laughs> hey. When you, you, you might want to stay out till way after dark, but y'all got dinner plans. You, you better listen to mama because you're going to have to live with her later on. You know what I mean? And so I, I've gotten smarter. Young fellas, I'm telling you, enjoy it now while it don't hurt, but it's coming. <laughs> Sowing, I, I, I hope I'm doing more than just making you laugh. Sowing and reaping. What are you sowing? Because what you're sowing is what you're going to reap. Law of the harvest, I didn't even finish the text, did I? I'm so sorry. If you'll stay an extra hour, I'll give you the rest of it. <laughs> it, it doesn't work like that. We'll just, I'm going to sit in here by myself and wait. we got a baby de dedication. After when we get done, we'll flip the camera back on and go for another hour for the three of you that sit with me. I mean, who, what am I talking about? I can't get you to even watch my videos for two minutes. you got to be kidding. That was a joke. You can laugh. You can laugh at me or with me. It's funny. Um, I mean, I know the gig. 13 seconds, and we're on to the next one. Um, so here's the deal. He, he's saying to them, you got to work. You, 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 what you sow, you're going to reap. He says here about the, the flesh and the spirit. Some of y'all are clueless. Like, you, you, you're new believers. Maybe you're older believers. You've been at it a long time. You literally didn't know there were things he said that, hey, when you guys do this, one, it's a sin, and number two, it's a picture of you indulging in the flesh rather than doing what God wants you to do. And so he gives us a list. He said, you got this struggle going on. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. It's not about are you guilty before God or not. It's about what God wants you to do versus what the devil wants you to be about. And he says in verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident. In other words, it's pretty obvious what God doesn't want you to be about. And he gives us a list, pretty popular list among a lot of locals. I'm just saying. Sexual immorality, more to the physical nature, right? Impurity and sensuality, that goes back more to thought life and how we talk. Idolatry, putting anything before God. Sorcery, enmity, strife, and jealousy, fits of anger. Does any of that fit into some of the political dialogue these days? How people get about masks and a whole lot of other stuff? I mean, we just immediately snap. It goes to how we deal in family. It goes to how we deal individually as a person. It goes to how we deal with other drivers on the road. It goes to how we deal with law enforcement, as a community level, national level, all these implications. These things are reflective of 
not of God and of Christ, but the reflective of the flesh. Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. Just the wonder and the orgies part of it, those are people that are drunk and doing sexual immorality. That's how that works. I'm just telling you what the Greek means. Um, and things like these. You know what things like these means? That's not the complete list of all the things that are a list of the things that are done out of indulgence to the flesh. So don't think I can't find another text to talk about the, the donuts. Because By the way, if you own Dunkin' Donuts, I'm not, that's not an insult. It just balance, right? It also then says, I want to warn you, as I warned you before, I've told you before, he said, that those that do these things aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. He said, people that do that aren't saved. When it says do these things, it's a picture of habitually and continually doing those things. I've said to you already, there's not a person in this room that's never sinned. There's not a person in this room that upon occasion doesn't act toward the flesh and not the spirit. It does not give you, and you don't get to go home and say, look, mama, it's a whoopsie. I accidentally was unfaithful today, but just want you to know, it's just one of those lapses. I'm still saved and all, so we're good, right? Uh-uh, I don't, I'm just telling you, if I go home, it don't work like that. But if we're talking about salvation, I can't determine yours. I can't tell you. I'm just going to tell you, I am glad that you don't know everything that's happened on my worst day. And I'm not even sure I can point out that day at this moment, but I am just tell you I'm glad that all of America doesn't know it. And I'm pretty confident you feel the same way. That every thought in your head doesn't run across everybody else's screen. That every action you've ever committed. But what I'm going to tell you is that God desires for us day to, by day to sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. It's a question of what are you feeding? Which dog inside of you are you going to give the meat to? And if you, give, if you, if you don't give... Boy, that's not necessarily a verse, but it's, it's real. Like, what are you, what are you going to sow? What are you going to... My little, my little sermon teaser, if you didn't see it, it was a little garden space out in front of the house, and we've got these pretty flowers, and there's no weeds, and the mulch is new, and all this that gets watered a lot. And that's because Christy didn't see that it gets all that. It's cared for. It's taken after. It's it, or taken care of. It's, it's, you can tell what people tend to. I mean, I was talking about the middle school kid. I can tell, I mean, you can tell who tends to themselves and who doesn't. It's not an insult. It's just, it's obvious what people care about and what they don't care about. And what I'm suggesting, what I'm encouraging the scripture teaches is that we should give care to the things of the spirit and not the things of the flesh. Why? Well, after that moment of sin is over and the initial impression of the flesh that gut feeling that led you astray is there the bible says that these are the things that reflect fruits of the spirit if we sow to the spirit here's what we get love joy peace do these things sound foreign to most of us today patience y'all hate that word kindness goodness Faithfulness, man, who can count on somebody? Gentleness, that's not going to come up in the top ten list of everything you hope that a man's man will be, but it's, it's in God's list of what he desired for us, and it was a picture of who Jesus was. And see, that's the problem, that in our own mind's eye, what we expect of our boys, what we expect of our young ladies, what we expect of grown individuals doesn't reflect the heart of God, and so we need to fashion our internal compass through God's Word, spend time in His Word. We were talking about prayer. How do you become relational with God? How do you build intimacy and relationship? It's, at some point, it's time. What are you sowing your time into? I'm encouraging those that have graduated. Don't, I mean, you might move away from home, but don't, if anything, increase, increase your Bible study time, your prayer time. Take the Word of God seriously when it says in Corinthians that bad company corrupts good habits or good morals, because it does. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be interacting with and around a group of people, but some of you know this. Like, you easily fall back into old habits. The picture that, part of the picture that was discussed last Sunday night was this idea that you get in a mental, a, a mental mindset where there's a routine, and if you don't break that routine, you're not going to be doing the things different than you've done them before. And part of this picture here is that 
You need to sow your life. And this is where connection matters because some of you know that you struggle in some areas. Well, look, summer's coming. And when summer comes, routine ends, whether it's school or other things, idle hands can be the devil's workshop. And so fill your time with something meaningful. Work does matter. Some of you ought to get a summer. I'm not just preaching at my son, but it just every, you ought, some of you ought, to get a, you ought to get a summer job. You ought, to, you ought to do something viable. Because putting energy towards something that has a payout is worthy. It matters. Some of us are trying to do too many things, and we don't put enough into the things that matter most. When I have this talk, it always scares me because I end up, <laughs> I end up having a bunch of folks that, well, the Lord told me that since you said we got to kind of get our time narrowed down and I'm doing too many things and so we were doing this and we don't need to be in the church now, we're going to go do that. And I'm like, mm, that ain't exactly what I meant. Uh, <laughs> I do, I get the fact that we have, it's a great thing in my view, it is, there, if I'm looking at the positives, and I do, I'm looking, I'm looking for good stuff. It is an incredible thing that we've gotten used to being at home more. It's, incredible, it's an incredible thing that the world stopped on a dime in a way nobody thought that it would have. And one of the positive outcomes is we eat at home more. It's that we have a lot more family time together. And many people have become very used to that. That's good. And then as we start to pull other activities back in, there's always like, I don't know if I'm ready to do it all quite like. You should measure that. As a church, candidly, you know this. We have continued to simplify and we've continued to be very direct on what our purpose is and there's no question here today i hope that we're farming disciples like those that have come in the last six months they know that as soon as we get an opportunity we're going to say hey we want to tell you more about how to be involved at emerald coast it involves salvation baptism small group serving and sharing and we know that if you're not saved and baptized that's the beginning place and it doesn't get really any farther or deeper then growing in relationship with him by studying the Bible in, in small groups of people where there's community and, 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 and connection that occurs, sharing that with other people, and serving the body of believers. All those things matter. There's a lot of other stuff you, we're just not going to offer or not have to do. Why? Because you've got plenty going on. If you get spread too thin, you don't do any of it well. Christianity was never intended to be one of a billion other things that you add to your life so that it's like, do y'all have a phone that's got a lot of apps that you never use? Like you needed it for a day to do a thing? Like I, I got a Google Authenticator thing e for a thing. And I can tell you what I think it was for, but like once every year I use that thing. I've had it a year, maybe. But it's way in the back. I don't know. I don't ever do anything with it. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I can start listing off, which I'm not going to tell you because there's more you want to know. Christianity's not just supposed to be an app. That hey, every once in a while I go to, that's not how it works. God desires for you to sow things that are to sow in the Spirit so that you can reap that which is of the Spirit. This principle is applied again in Galatians chapter 6 where he says, God will not be mocked. That which you reap, you will also, or what sow, you will also reap. In other words, God is affirming the principle of the harvest. He's saying this is true. Now here's what's crazy. When we sow to the flesh, and I, gotta, I, gotta, I know what time, i got to hurry up. When we sow to the flesh, one, it, it, I've seen these lists before. There's a law, what happens with the law of the harvest, and then there's what happens when you commit a sin. So like with the laws of the harvest, the law of the harvest, the first law says that um, you're gonna, you, you will reap in kind with what you plant. It's true, you plant corn, you get corn. The second law says that you're going to reap more than you plant. That's, like, that's how it works. You don't ever, if you, if you plant a, a, a cucumber seed, you're not going to have one cucumber. You're going to have a vine, you're going to have a bunch of them. You're going to have them galore. You're going to have pickles, and you're going to have all kind of fun stuff. Just how it works. And not only do you reap what you plant and more than you plant, you reap it later than you planted it. Right? So it takes time. Some of you are like, I did that one day and I didn't really get nothing popped up. I read the Bible that morning. No joy popped up that afternoon. <laughs> kind of didn't work. I tried that. Done there, been there, done it. It didn't work like that. You didn't become a professional athlete just by deciding you were one, right? right. So here's the prince. Watch this alongside of the law of, the har of, 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 of what happens with sin. So the law of the harvest, I should have an image and just fingers pointing at you, but the law of the harvest, if it says that you, you sow it and then you reap it in kind, that is true. But then the fact that you reap 
more than you sow. It is also true with sin. Sin also always takes you farther than you wanted to go. So you're sowing and reaping in kind, but you're reaping more of it. It took you farther than you really wanted to go. Sounded like a great idea to have a little. But then all of a sudden, I woke up, I didn't know what I did, and I was in trouble. I had to call the attorney. Takes you farther than you wanted to go. It costs you more than you were willing to pay. Yes. Right? Yes. So those two principles both come in this idea that you reap in kind and more of it. And then the, the, the third part of this is that you reap it later. So the law of the harvest says you reap it later. So you do some things now, and you say, well, I did this, and I didn't really call a problem. I looked at that, I did that, I saw that woman. I, 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 I said these things to that guy. We got in the fisticuffs. I, over time, it's going to come back. You're going to reap all that, and you're going to reap more of it, and it's going to stay around longer than you wanted it to. Amen. Did you just see that principle play out? I don't know that I've ever seen the two connect and tie together. When we say it, we're up here and we sang the blessing, and we talked about God's blessing from generation to generation, and, and, and it fills us. We're like, oh, yes, Lord, that's what I want. Listen to me. Do not let the enemy get in your head over stuff you have asked forgiveness for. You hear me say that? Because those of you that get this, the more spiritual among you, candidly, that understand that principle already, there's shame that's building up. Hear me. Jesus took that and separated it already. It's the devil that's inside of you saying, well, you've got to go back there. No, 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 no. But you do need to be aware in advance before you do that thing that's going to end, result in the pain, not because God doesn't want you to do anything fun, but because he wants to spare you some pain and allow you to enjoy love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If you don't sow it, it's very unlikely you're going to reap it. And if you sow it, you're going to reap more of it. And if you sow it, you're going to reap it later. You're going to keep reaping it. And you're going, you're going to be, it's, it's going to stay around a while. So whenever your schedule gets a little looser in the summer, whatever you take off from, don't take off from God. Don't take off from his word. If anything, you ought to buckle down a little bit. Stay connected. That's why everything's all over the place with the, the technology. We're trying to keep you connected. Here's what's cool. We live in a world for the last two years there's so much we can't control. It's by the sovereignty of God we've been saved. He's allowed some things to occur in our life, and unfortunately, sometimes we pay consequences of what other people have done. That's true. I don't have all the answers, but I'm telling you, that's part of it. But I can promise you that if you will sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap relative to the Spirit. And if you sow to the flesh... Like that's within your charge. You can choose to become more, more intimate with Jesus Christ. You can choose to become a student of the word. You can choose to have your heart become like his heart. It's not going to just happen one day. It's a choice you get to make. You choose what you sow into the life of your family. You kind of hear what I'm saying? These things matter. So the good news is that we can make some good choices, some positive choices that are cause and effect. I'm going to pray this morning and it's going to change my attitude for the day. I'm going to put it in his hands today or tonight when I go to bed. And I know that when I wake up in the morning, it's a brand new day with brand new mercies. I'm going to offer forgiveness. And I know that as I've offered forgiveness to others, the Lord is going to forgive me. I'm going to offer grace to others. And I'm going to sow that in my life. And I know that as I offer grace to others, God is going to allow me to. I'm going to be generous as an individual, generous with time, generous financially, generous with, with talent. And as a result of that, I know that that's going to produce in kind over time. And it's going to multiply exponentially, right? And God is going to allow me to see and reap that. He's like, I'm not that prosperity guy. You don't understand. I'm talking about compounding interest of being a person that invests in things of the Spirit. It's real, it's a principle, and it works. Eventually, most of us don't have the patience to keep doing with consistency, habitually, things that make a difference over time. They say of great leaders, and I'm going to shut it down, they say of great leaders that they do consistently what others do occasionally. They do it day after day after day after day, and over time, those habits and that lifestyle yields a result. And the result, in some cases, is that you get to keep your teeth because you brush your tooth, teeth every day. 
And in other cases, you get to, to yield an incredible relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because you've invested in him every day in prayer, because you've studied the word, because you've been a friend to others. He who is friendly has friends, right? Sowing and reaping. Apply this principle in a positive way this week and see if over time God doesn't bring up some beautiful crops. Parents, let me encourage you, talk to your kids about this law of the harvest and how you've seen it work and play out in your life in ways that you care to share on the bad side and ways that, in ways that have been beneficial on the good side. Prove to them the word is true. Let's pray and then, man, they're going to sing an incredible song. And for some of you I hadn't had a chance to meet when that song is over, I'll be out front and would love to meet some of you. Uh, first time guest, you can certainly meet us at the table uh, and we'd love to give you a free gift. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the special time that we've shared. Lord, we've, we've looked at word. Your authoritative command of scripture that never changes has said that if we sow to the, to the flesh, that we are going to have consequences of the flesh pop up in our lives. And it's not going to be pretty. It doesn't take us where we want to go. It doesn't even take us to a functional society. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't take us to a place we want to be as a community, as a church, individually, as a family. It doesn't create the kind of schools that we want to have. We want people that are faithful and uh, kind and generous and loving. Lord, I pray that you would allow us individually in this body of believers to focus on sowing into our lives things that truly matter from your word, but but also, Father, these attitudes that are of the Spirit of God, they reflect your heart. They are, they are good because they are a picture of who you are. Lord, we desire to love others unconditionally. We desire to look at others and value them not based on works done, but on who created them. We desire and ask you to help us to control our tongues, to control our actions, to be people of intention and to follow after not selfish indulgence, but Lord, to follow after the spirit of the living God. We thank you that as turtles on a fence post, <laughs> you found us with your grace. And Lord, we pray that as we walk each day, sometimes feeling an awful lot like a turtle, that we would continue to walk towards you day after day after day. Onward and upward, upward, sanctified more and more each day, becoming more the image of Jesus Christ. May we encourage one another. May we find hope. May we leave shame behind. And Father, may we celebrate our King of glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.